Welcome back to Careers Explained. Today, we're talking with Eric Schnurstein about his career path and current role. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan in French and English, and his master's in business administration from Lawrence Technological University. His previous work experience includes working as the department manager of market research for CX Group, as an installation coordinator for General Motors, and as a project analyst and team leader for Trilogy International. He is now a manager of change management and communications for Ford Motor Company, where he has worked for over 20 years. Welcome, Eric, and thanks for coming on today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks, Heidi. Can you start by describing what you do in your current role? I can. Um, So I work as a manager at Ford Motor Company, very well-known brand, very uh, large automotive company uh, in Southeast Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan is our headquarters. And I have a very global role because it is a very multinational company. So within the company, I've done a lot of jobs, but you asked me about my current one. And that is uh, I'm on the leadership team that coordinates life for our employees in a, a few special countries. Um, That would be Hungary, Romania, India, and uh, Mexico. And these, we have business centers in each of these uh, countries. And I help to coordinate the, uh, on a big view, the work that is done in those locations that supports the large multinational company that is Ford. And specifically, I'm a manager of change. So that means I do a lot of work in communications. I lead a small team that looks at what information we need to send out and what change we want to impact within the company. We put together communications plans to change, to inform and change behaviors for thousands of people within this large company. So it touches a lot of depending on the project, it touches on a lot of different things. Everything from recruiting. So when we want to add positions, I work to position the message for our talent acquisition team to, you found me in LinkedIn, right? Post post uh, positions open in LinkedIn and our job boards. I touch that sometimes. Uh, on the other end, I, I I dealt with uh, coming out of the pandemic, this concept of return to work or return to the office. I crafted with my team a communications campaign to help employees know what to expect when they come back to the office. So it's a very internal focus. So there's a lot of different things I can work on. That's just a couple examples. But part of it is leadership. Part of it is understanding what the company needs and trying to influence behavior toward that end. And for those overarching goals, you mentioned two examples with the talent acquisition and then letting people know about coming back to work. What are some of the most common roles or responsibilities that those overarching goals break down into? Spent a lot of time within the company, a little bit of internal politics, uh, which I won't get into, you know, any trade secrets or anything on the, on the public podcast, but <laughs> but helping the company organize for success. Where should work be done, be accomplished by who in large groups of people? So I spent a lot of time structuring for that, doing benchmarking, gathering what other companies do for their success and choosing what's best for Ford. And then, as I mentioned, putting together the communication plan or the project plan to deliver on those desired changes. And can you give some examples of your standard days or weeks, depending on how much that varies, of where those roles and tasks are falling in terms of chunks of time? Yeah, uh, day in the life of Eric Schnurstein, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I no longer work a standard eight to five day because it's a global company. I have team members supporting me in India, in Mexico City, which is two hours behind uh, my my time zone. I'm in the Eastern time zone in the Dearborn, Michigan area. So 
I have to, I choose to adjust my work time to fit the needs of my team. So often that will mean I'll start my day talking to an internal customer or someone on my team in India and they have to make an adjustment too. They're catching me after dinner time. Mm -hmm. So we can speak in, in, in real time and they can tell me what they accomplished in their work day or what their current needs are. And I can either progress those needs during my workday, if it's a collaborative type of thing, or I can give them instruction that they can start working on their next day, right? They hang up with me, go to bed, enjoy the rest of their dinner, family time, whatever, wake up the next morning to work in India, right? And my, so then, so I usually start my day with some, some version of a conference call mm -hmm. before I even have breakfast. Uh, sometimes before I turn the camera on, right? <laughs> so depending on depending on um, the timing and the project and who I need to talk to, and then I will take take some time uh, as a break, whether I'm working from home or working in the office, because I uh, we have a hybrid work model in my area, so I can choose when to go to the office. I'm there somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of my work days. Today, I'm in my home office. I've still made it look a lot like Ford Motor Company. You can see I have a nice mustache. I love the decor. <laughs> um, so I, I want to make it feel like a workspace. Um, so when I uh, am at home, I will I will take breaks throughout the day to balance my work-life balance, right? If I'm going to start at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then if I'm going to be talking to my Mexico uh, partners until 5 p.m., 6 p.m., I, I need to take care of myself too, right? So I am i don't have a set schedule. I need to be flexible. My weekends are mine. Uh, I, I, I don't have to work weekends unless I'm behind on a project and choose to, but that's not common. There were times in my career when I did have to do some things on the weekends, but that's fortunately no longer the case. Uh, so that that's kind of the day in the life broad brush. I may have gotten away from your question. Did I answer it? No, you definitely, uh, in terms of the timing, answered that. And then can you delve a little bit more into the content of those meetings that you're having with different teams? What are you guys talking about in those meetings if there's a general theme between groups? Sure. So I I work in a large company. I'm, uh, for lack of a better word, middle management, right? Mm -hmm. So I have team members that I'm talking to. Uh, there, I the tone of those conversations are, uh, here's some work I need you to do, or how's the work going that you're working on, and how can I help you? So I have a lot of my leadership style. I tend to be like a servant leader, so I, I at least I try to be. So I ask a lot of questions. How's this work going? What help do you need? Can I free up some resources to help? Do I have an idea that would help? You can tell I'm a talkative person. I, I tend to have a lot of ideas and I like to share them. And uh, sometimes I have to tell my team members, you know, okay, I'm not telling you this as your boss. I'm telling you this because I like to collaborate with you. So if the idea is not very good, please don't use it. <laughs> you know? So those conversations frequently uh, kind of go back and forth between collaboration and direction. And I've learned to be very careful to make sure my team members know the difference, right? Important because, expectation. <laughs> yeah, because I, because I, a lot of times they have better ideas than I do, or their implementation of them is better than me, and I don't want them to take the boss's suboptimal idea and try to optimize it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather them take a better idea and do it their own way, right? So, so I have to be very clear about that. So those conversations are often very um, open ended. I will say, okay, show me your project plan, show me your progress report, give me that in advance, let me take a look at that, and then we'll have a conversation about it, and I'll give you some feedback and some direction. Um, then, because I said I'm kind of a middle manager in a very large company, I spend some time on the other end talking to my leader and other leaders that are internal customers uh, of my group. So there I ask a lot of questions. What do you need? Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Are we delivering what you want? Uh, and so then I have to ask good questions and, and, and listen. Take really good notes. 
because not everybody speaks the same way and I have to adapt my learning style developed as a student, right? You have different professors, different teachers. You, you have to learn from all of them. Well, I have to learn that when I'm listening to my leadership team giving me directions on what to deliver. So sometimes we have to circle back and, you know, reiterate some things. Did you really want this? Um, the active listening, you know, running a Google search on active listening skills uh, would be a really good thing to do to understand what I, how I spend my time in, in communication, right? And I also attend a lot of meetings. So uh, I try to be very careful about how I spend my time in meetings. If I don't have a specific role there, I try not to attend, but I get invited to a lot of things. Uh, kind of a high profile job within within some parts of the company, it's kind of a high profile job. I don't just sit in a cave and work by myself. It's very interactive, very collaborative. So a lot of people want me to know about things. I have to be careful because as my first boss told me, if you're in a meeting, you're not working. Now, I'm going to re rephrase that. If you're in a meeting, unless you're running the meeting, you're not delivering anything. You might be learning what to deliver but you're not actually delivering. So you got to have some private time, focus time. So I will block time on my on my company calendar. It says focus time. I'm meeting with myself. It's a meeting with Eric. And, and, and that gives me the chance to go kind of heads down, focus, contemplate, because every place I've worked, so I think this is how the world is, the world doesn't give you time to think. Yet, if you're going to be successful, you have to have time to reflect. So I have to schedule it for myself sometimes. So working between those two levels of maybe getting the orders around what projects need to be done, timelines, specifics, and then relaying that and making sure that all the teams have what they need to execute the projects needed from the other level is a big portion of those meetings, it sounds like. Yes. It is. It is. And and uh, the contempl another thought about the contemplation time, often I'm given ambiguous assignments. Mm. It, it, it's Eric, can you solve this problem? We need to we need to understand better how to support our teams in such and such a market to be more agile. OK, what does that mean? That's very specific. That, that's not very specific. Mm. So I need contemplation time to figure out what that means, how to take a very fuzzy assignment and make it very specific, and then communicate back to whoever the stakeholder is, right? Is it is it someone on my team? Is it a leader? Is it a customer? Say, okay, this is what I heard from you. I thought about it. This is what I think we should do. Here's my proposal. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to do that whenever a new request comes to me, I try to do that in 24 hours. Um, if you wait, whoever's asking you for help might assume you're not interested or you're not gonna deliver. So whenever I hear a new request, I, I try to get back to them. And, and often that's something really quick, right? So, so I don't need to figure out everything but a summary of an initial approach goes a long way. So I'll hear a request, I'll schedule my contemplation time, I'll write a, an email message, um, or occasionally I'll record a video of myself explaining it, and I'll <laughs> send that back. And I'll say, okay, this is what I heard from you, this is what I think we should do, is this what you're expecting? Is this gonna meet your needs? And if the answer is yes, then we can implement. Frequently, the answer is mm, not quite. I like what you started, but here's where I really want you to go. And then you really get clarity on, on a project. So at the core, I'm a project manager in a very collaborative environment, working on lots of different types of projects. So I need to be a little bit of a generalist and I need to be agile and I need to be comfortable working in areas where I don't have specific expertise and and figuring out where to get that expertise. 
really almost acting as a consultant, clarifying the objective from your managers, making sure that you have an outline approved before you go relay the task. Yes. Other yeah. Yeah. And the, the same skills I'm using are often used in the consulting world. That's very true. Which is all very important to get that objective right and done efficiently. And when you talk about working on multiple projects at the same time, how many usually are you managing and how long do those typically take? The answer varies a lot. Today, I'm concerned with four or five projects. There are a few other things in flight that, that aren't going to need my attention today. And they will be done within two or three months on average. So that, that's that's the short answer, right? That's the that's the too long didn't read answer of uh, <laughs> about a handful of projects, two or three month duration from, from start to finish. Some of them are obviously outliers in that. But it's still helpful to get a sense of it's not one project that's a year long. You work in a variety of things that have a relatively frequent turnover. Throughout yeah. the year. We do have annual objectives. Mm -hmm. So the, the vision is usually a 12 month or longer vision. But then we chunk it down into a quarter. What are we going to do this quarter to support that vision? Breaking it down the big goal into smaller, more feasible check-ins. Yes. And then my job is to break it down even further and say, okay, what are we going to do this week? What are we going to do today? Mm -hmm. Man manage the progress there. Yes. And what do you like and find challenging about the role? I like the variety. I like the people. I work with, I work with some really interesting people. And they're not all from the same backgrounds as me. And so I, I really like that. And I found that throughout my career that I find myself either working with people uh, from different countries or from different backgrounds. Early in my career, I, I, I'm, I'm not an engineer. You mentioned my, my degree in, in the opener. I spent a few years working with engineers within Ford Motor Company in our product development area. And so, that was interesting to me because I was it was a little bit out of my element. And so I like that. I like that in my current role as well. I seem to seek out roles like that where I can have a core set of skills that I'm good at and I can apply them in new ways with with new people who don't think and act just like me. Using utilizing the diversity of backgrounds and talents to be efficient. Yeah. You know, um there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis on on diversity, uh, DEI, and 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 rightly so. One of the things that isn't often enough emphasized in that conversation is diversity of ideas, and I look for that. Now, to get diversity of ideas, I often have I often experience diversity of of backgrounds as well. So we're getting to the same place. But what I really value is is diversity of thought patterns. Exactly, which that I think most of the biggest companies recognize the value that that adds, hence being global, utilizing the different backgrounds to innovate in effective ways. And so from your position as a manager, what are the opportunities for moving up? I love the question. Uh, so in Ford Motor Company, we have three or four levels of like individual contributor, non-supervisor roles. And then we have six layers of management. Okay. I'm part way up that management chain right now. Okay. I I'm always thinking about the next level. I'm not always expecting it. And I have found that I've been fairly successful in getting promoted when I'm not necessarily looking for the promotion. I'm looking for the experiences that get me ready for the promotion. I'm networking quite a bit within the company because I've had, I've had almost 20 years of experience as a Ford employee and almost every two years I get a new job. So I've had about 10 and and some of those are, I get them by evolution and some of them by revolution, but I'm always looking, okay, what can I do to make myself more ready 
for the next position. And because Ford's a big enough company, I can move, we call them chimneys <laughs> informally, right? There's different areas of the company, right? There's, you know, engineering, marketing, uh, logistics, uh, IT, all these different areas of the company. And, and, and I can move within them because I have skills that transfer in different areas. Everybody needs a project manager, right? Everybody needs a good leader of people. So I've been working on those skills. So to answer your question, what are my prospects for moving up? I'm learning. I'm learning something new this year that I didn't learn last year. So that means my chances are improving, okay? Uh, I also have to look at, I say, look at the, look at the trade winds, um, but see kind of how the internal job market is looking. What is the company valuing right now? It might be different than what they valued two or five years ago. It's certainly different than what was needed when I first started with the company. So I try to learn, anticipate where the company is going and, and learn the, the new skills to make myself available for that. Um, so I think my chances are pretty good. I'm, I'm not done learning. I'm not done growing. And I hope I'm not done getting rewarded for that uh, from the company. So at the same time, I'm not in a situation right now where I'm actively seeking out uh, a different job or applying for it. So th there comes a point. So if you have listeners who uh, work for or want to work for a, a large company, there comes a point in your working relationship with your boss where you say, what stage you're at in the in the cycle? and and Am I growing in my current position or am I ready to look for something new? And you have to be, I have chosen to be very transparent with whoever I'm working for to say, okay, I've been in this role for two and a half years. I feel like I haven't grown much in the last year. I'm ready for a new experience. And then we have that conversation of, can I get that new experience without changing titles? Do they have other work that I could contribute to? Can they help me or can they help me find another position at, within the company? And I've been fortunate to have leaders who understand career development and try to help me in that. And that is the best position to be in when you can have your boss say to their peers, hey, I know a person who's really good, ready to move, has some skills you might want. And so I, I, instead of like looking for a job, sometimes the jobs can find me. Definitely. And that's again, that communication piece, but internally with your managers, I think the transparency is a great point to highlight because it doesn't have to be a secretive going against the grain. You can really be open and honest about how mutually beneficial you either moving up or staying in expanding your role can be and so I think that's Perfect. great yes I've also uh to, to give a specific uh tip yeah. more than once I've said to my my boss different bosses different years teach me your job because when you're done with it I'd like it <laughs> All right and 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 I can say that privately is like a joke yeah. but but it's it's true if it's true it's a great thing to say because because then they uh, whoever that person is that that man or woman can invite me into parts of their job that I don't normally see and I can keep growing right and it also helps them if they have if their organization is going so well that there's an someone ready to take it over yeah then they can get promoted too right so you kind of help your boss to be promotable exactly um and but but you can't use that line if you're not prepared to deliver it right <laughs> uh or if you don't think the relationship with your boss is is on solid enough footing for that mm -hmm. but i've used it a couple times and it's really been helpful it 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 kind of takes away it it it, it quickly wipes away the clouds of secrecy and and sets a very clear statement of you know i want your job <laughs> whenever it is you're done with it I'd like it so you can, can I shadow you now can, can you prepare me for that 
or, or jobs like it. Yeah, the win-win mindset of seeking continuous improvement and learning that can benefit both you and your boss is really a winner mindset right there. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I actually uh, tell you a little story that's maybe not aligned with your question? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. So, <laughs> so uh, navigating within the company, this is all kind of related. Find a mentor uh, who can help you see your blind spots. And it really helps for people who are interested in sort of moving up that metaphorical job ladder, find a mentor two levels up. The reason why you need one two levels up is because those are the people who are going to be promoting you. <sighs> if you just talk to your boss and their peers, they can't promote you into their jobs. You need to go up a level for those conversations. So you need to you, you need to think about what you're learning, who you're talking to, and that's also related to your personal brand. So develop a personal brand and get it known to the people who can help you move up that ladder. And most leaders, myself included, appreciate when someone who happens to be lower on the organizational chart asks them a question that's career oriented. Most managers like that. Some will have more time than others for it, but our job in part is to develop the leaders that follow us. So I try to exploit that as an individual contributor as well. Well, and I think that's, as you said, it helps both parties because it's part of their job, but also just most people appreciate genuine interest in what they're doing. So as you said before, with you're constantly networking internally, yeah. As long as it's genuine, just like you said, with the job line about, I want your job, most people will usually respond well to that if they have the time, like you mentioned. So I think that's great advice, especially the two levels up, really find yeah. the decision makers who has the power in the room, spend most of your time there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I actually kind of learned it the hard way. I was in a group, this is a number of years ago, but I was in a, in a, in a team and a, a team leader position opened up and and I was surprised at who was chosen it wasn't me and and I asked the guy I'm like what why do you, I don't remember exactly how it came up but I asked him like you know how did you how did you get this role yeah. and he said I asked for it and I was like you can do that <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's one of the biggest parts of why I'm so grateful for you coming on is there are so many stories or incidents like that where you have to learn through either your own experience of it or someone else telling you. And so you sharing that with someone might save them the experience of not realizing you can ask and you can be proactive about seeking that next role. It really makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you don't tell people what you're interested in doing, they can't help you achieve it. Don't expect them. Don't wait for them to read your mind. Right. right. And so then on that career path, can you talk about the major points that led you to your current role, especially with the English and French major? And <laughs> how do you get into the automotive industry and what helped you move up from there? Yeah. So when I was in college, I didn't know what I want to be when I grew up. I still don't, by the way. <laughs> I'm still I'm still discovering myself. And I'm enjoying that journey. But I studied what I liked and what I was good at. So for all the English majors in your audience or or, or other, maybe a psych major or a history major, I, I remember hearing two things. What are you going to do with that? Or you can do anything with that. Both of them are true. <laughs> because you're not learning a technical skill that is immediately fits into a nice cookie cutter job description. But you are learning some good analytical skills. Um, 
an English major is a it, you learn a lot about the human condition by reading a lot of novels and a lot of characters and writing a lot of papers and creative projects and you learn a lot about yourself so those skills are transferable to someone like a, a project manager they're not transferable to become an engineer right or a surgeon I'm not going to be good at those things uh, I don't know. I haven't tried, but let's not. Yeah, not with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I I took the approach of uh, studied what I liked and what I was getting, what I was successful in, and I wound up leaving University of Michigan with a um, honors English major, a French major, and I took a whole bunch of business classes because I thought maybe I should know something practical. So mm -hmm. I took an accounting class, an econ class. It doesn't show up as a minor on my degree, but all those classes kind of helped me because I wound up in the business world later. And uh, I always kind of thought I would get a graduate degree of some type, maybe an MBA, maybe, maybe grad school for English or history, and I'd become a professor or something. So I, I really finished my college studies not really knowing what I wanted to do, knowing I needed to get a job and make some money and keep figuring it out. So that's that's what I did. I figured it out and I'm still figuring it out. I'm just really com comfortable with the company I'm with now. It took me a while to find that company. Yeah. And And along the way, I tried some things and realized I wasn't, either wasn't ready for them or I wasn't good at them. So when I graduated college, I, I needed to make some money. I didn't, I was a, a little bit afraid to do a full job search. Uh, and, and so I kind of fumbled my way into work because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I was sort of interested in teaching, but I didn't have a teaching degree. I knew I was sort of interested in leadership because I just tended to gravitate that way in, in some of my student jobs. And I also knew that I lived in Southeast Michigan where a lot of people work for automotive companies, um, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Stellantis, as it's called now. And so a lot of my peers were gonna work in the automotive industry or become teachers because I studied with a lot of English and French majors who become teachers. And I said to myself, God, I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, be careful what you say to God. Because <laughs> he has a sense of humor. So I, after working in a couple different places and learning a few things, I found myself in the automotive industry <laughs> where I said I wasn't going to be. And I found myself working in leadership positions where I find myself teaching not not a capital T teaching, uh, but but <laughs> helping others get better. Yeah. And so I, I I do that a lot as a project manager and a communicator. I use a lot of the same skills the teacher does. I learn something and then I convey it to lots of people and expect them to learn a skill and uh, and 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 fly right. So I, I kind of wound up doing some of the things I thought I would always do and some of in, in a place I never thought I would because everybody else was going automotive. Oh, I'm not going to do that, but here I am. So I, I've, I've liked that a lot. Yeah. Um, another part of this answer is, is jobs that don't appear on, on your resume. Can I talk about that for a moment? Absolutely. Please do. Okay. So we all have them, right? Jobs that happen before we graduate college that just sort of fall off. Mm -hmm. I worked in an ice cream store as my first job, like making soft surf, right? And and I wound up staying there for seven years, part time seasonally. Before I was done, I was a manager of the of the job. Well, I didn't want to have a career in ice cream. I didn't want to be a short order cook for a career. I didn't want to own an, a restaurant, but I learned something there. And it's all because I tried stuff because I had a friend who worked at the store. And I thought it might be an okay place to work when I was 15 years old. Um, so also in college as a part-time job, I worked at a, I was a tour guide in a dinosaur museum and I got to run the planetarium for a while because I like stars 
So I liked astronomy, even though I wasn't going to be an astrophysicist. It was kind of fun for a while. Well, I learned something about myself. I learned not that I wanted to run a planetarium, but that I'm comfortable hearing my own voice in front of people. If I know the, if I know what I'm talking about, if I'm within my comfort zone of expertise, I can talk a lot, as you might have noticed throughout this podcast, <laughs> where you're asking me to talk about myself and my experiences. Mm -hmm. So try stuff. If you have any uh, listeners who are a little earlier in their careers or pre-career, try stuff. Go spend six months doing a part-time job in a career you know you're not going to do, but learn about yourself while you're there. And, and figure out what you're learning about yourself as you do it. Um, I, I don't frown upon any of the, you know, in your teens or in your 20s, college jobs, summer jobs. Maybe you're painting houses. Maybe you're working at a canoe livery. Those might never appear on your resume, but they might help you figure out what you want on your resume. So I think there's a lot of value to that. Yeah, I love the point of being open-minded, trying a diversity of tasks because the experimentation is really what helps you figure out what you do and you don't want. And then also that mindset that you still have in your role of seeking to continuously learn whatever your role is, whether it's ice cream or manager at Ford, what are you learning? How are you maximizing the opportunity you have to move forward? Yeah, um, we keep talking about learning. Uh one little pithy statement here is if you're going to have 10 years, if you're going to work someplace for 10 years, get at least 10 years of experience, not one year of experience 10 times over. Mm -hmm. What okay. are you, what are you going to do with the job that you have? Correct. Correct. So uh, early on at Ford, I had a job working in uh my job was to learn a little bit about computer-aided design. Remember, I'm not an engineer, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. And manage a project to teach uh, suppliers to Ford Motor Company what software tools to buy and use and train their people on so that when they designed a part that they would manufacture, it would fit Ford Motor Company's needs, right? Both digitally and physically. So that sounds really interesting. So I jumped right into it, but I couldn't design a part. Nobody, nobody taught me how to do that in my French class um, or my history class, right? But what I wound up doing, because I was fairly good at the project management part, is that I wound up kind of leading the team on how to, how to deploy a project. And along the way, I learned a few things about what it's like to be a supplier, an automotive supplier. So when you go visit, uh, if anyone has the opportunity to like go visit a, a business customer. So in this case, I was going out to a supplier for Ford Motor Company that was designing engine parts, right? Some of them were high tech uh, gears for transmissions or, or pistons. Some of them were bolts and fasteners. I don't know much about that business, but when you go to see them and you sell your idea, they say, would you like, would you like a walkthrough of our facility here? I always said yes. I always said yes. And so then after doing that a few dozen times, I know a little something about the supply chain. I know the difference between a bolt manufacturer and a piston manufacturer. They're really different because the parts are One's way more complex than the others. And I built some context there. So by doing that, by taking that job, by jumping into the project and by listening and talking to people and off and, and consuming what they offered me, I now know something about supply chain management. So I'm ready to go back to a question you asked me earlier on how are you preparing for your next job? Mm -hmm. Well, I can take some of the things I'm practicing now, combine it with stuff early in my career. I might be a good candidate for a position in supply chain management. Always only because, right? Only only because I paid attention and I listened. And when someone said, "Can I can I give you a tour of our factory?" I said, "Sure." 
And that goes to your point about the open-minded with even your earlier careers, but also the opportunities in your current roles of saying yes to learning boots on the ground research and just being open to hearing from people about what they do. Yes, yes. Uh, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I learned from everybody else. And then on that idea of being a learner, but also in your role as a teacher, can you give advice of things that you've learned over your long career that could help someone starting out? Some advice that you have on how to both figure out what you want to do and then in your role, be successful. Sure. Uh, it's a very open-ended question. I've got a few things. You need to um, know yourself. And if you don't know yourself, as I've mentioned, try some things and see what what feels good. But then you got to remember and you got to keep track of that somehow. So it's almost a part-time project to work on your own career development. I often block off one or two hours, usually on Friday afternoons when it's a quiet time in my work week to focus on myself. How did this week go? Did I learn something? Am I being successful? What am I learning? Is there an online webinar or class I can take to learn more about a topic that would help me to be more successful? Should I go back and get another degree? We didn't talk about, you mentioned my MBA um, yeah. earlier on. I, I wound up getting a, a master's of business administration with a focus on an, on an IT category, management information systems, because at the time I was working in IT at Ford Motor Company. Um, and so I sensed that the company would like me to have more skills, more formal training in the place I would, in the skill team or the department I was already working in. So I did that, right? I'm not in IT anymore, but it helped me then. And it helps me now when I deal with the folks in IT because uh, I have colleagues in the management levels in that area and I can speak their language because I have the formal training and I used to work in that area. So that happened because one day on a Friday afternoon, I, I did a little soul searching and said, what do I need to do next to, to, to advance, to learn? And I came up with, oh, maybe it's time to go back to school and maybe I should do it in an IT type of way. It wasn't hardcore IT because I didn't want to do a lot of coding. Yeah. So I made it a business degree because everywhere I work is a business. Even if I wind up working in a nonprofit sometime, it's still a business. Yeah. So taking a, an MBA was nice to give me a, a broad knowledge of all aspects of of running a business so and would recommend for those interested in getting into a role like middle management like yours yeah. do you think an mba is required at some point in your training it's not required but it works for me the the reason why it worked for me is it is it gave me a, a generalist approach so all of my education has been general my work experience have been specific. So uh, one of my mentors described when you're planning your career, think about the letter pi. And I don't, I don't have visual aid here, but but the, the letter pi has like a, a you know a tabletop across the top and then and then two pillars going down. So develop a, a generalist approach in some ways, that's the sort of crossbar, the top top line horizontal on, on pi, and then develop some expertise going deep in one area, maybe five years of that. And when you're done with that, start a second area. And if you have the depth in two different subject areas and, and a broad context for that as well, you, you tend to be successful for a variety of jobs. The trick is pick those two deep, uh, choose wisely for those, for those deep dives. So is an MBA essential? No, but it works for me to get that generalist view. If you have another way to do that, go for it. Mm -hmm. So some companies have a program, some large companies, including Ford, have a program where you 
rotate jobs for the first few years of your career when you first enter in and you get a broad view of the company. I didn't do that. That's not how I got to Ford. So I didn't have that opportunity, but that would be a way to get that generalist view without an MBA. And then maybe you get a master's degree in one of those deeper uh, deeper subject areas that might be a little more technical or more specific to, to what someone wants to do. And can you elaborate on that? I love the graphic of the pie and the two deep dives. You mentioned throughout this kind of finding the trade winds of where you need to be moving with the company and you sense that you should go into management information systems based on your role. Do you have advice for someone trying to figure out what would be best for them to deep dive into on how to read those wins? Social media is a big help right now. Um, LinkedIn for the business environment is really helpful. Reading sources like Fast Company tends to be a little bit more on the the trendier side of what's happening in in the market. The market for talent. I don't mean the stock market. The market for talent. And so I, I would do that. Also, if you're geographically uh, settled, uh, I've spent most of my career, I, I have a global viewpoint, but I spent most of my career living in Southeast Michigan. So I need to know what's going on here. So I need to kind of tune into the talent market here. For someone who isn't locked to a location, that doesn't apply. But, uh, you know, read, read, if you're working in an industry, read the journals for the industry. It's all online now. It's easy to find. Spend two hours every Friday afternoon doing that. Maybe that's that's your learning for a while, right? But learning the trade winds, uh, as you mentioned, I, I think looking at follow your company. If you work for a big company, follow that company or the company you want to work for and its competitors. See what people, see what the leaders of those organizations are posting about on LinkedIn and in the, in the, in the newspaper, uh, in the online newspapers and, and follow those and then find something you like and follow. It. So for me, I'm kind of looking at, uh, at data right now, big data, data analysis. That seems to be for my world, like the, the new new gold to go look for, um, because there's so much information available these days. Someone who knows how to manage it, interpret it, fold it into their stories to tell, because I'm a storyteller. It's part of my communications job, uh, part of my role. That's a piece of my resume where I'd like to improve a little bit. So that, that'll be sort of the next area that I look into personally because I see that that's what the company needs. I see that that's what other companies are looking for and talking about online. Market research for your own role about your company, your industry, and pairing it with your interests sounds like a great place to start. Yeah. Can and, I give you two more quick thoughts? Yeah, so I was just going to say. Um, so, so I've looked at some of the other guests you've had on Careers Explained. Some of them are more entrepreneurial um, or not working for quite a big company like I am. The really important thing is to know yourself and figure out, do you want to take that risk as an individual, as an entrepreneur to either start your own company or start a major facet of it? Um, or are you comfortable taking direction? And for me, I'm a little bit of both, but I'm comfortable taking direction. It's the less risky approach. So that's how I've been successful because I bring that orientation to the large company in which I work. So if someone thinks they want to work for a large company, you have to figure out if you can take direction. If you can't take direction well, maybe choose another path. Okay. <laughs> um, and the second thing, uh, last thing I'll mention uh, is have a personal operating system to manage the flow of information. I've been using, it's old school, but I, I've been using a Franklin planner for 25 years, okay? And I have all these online tools and they're great, but, and, and I use them too, but on the left side of the page every morning, I write down what I hope to achieve. And on the right side of the, of the planner, I write down what happens. And I have a physical record. To tell me how successful I was being every day. Do I have it? You know, I, part of that is a to-do list. Part of that's a, a log of every time somebody calls me, I write down their name. So I remember that it happened because maybe there's something to do about that. Maybe there's a task 
the next day to do that I haven't thought of yet. So I'm a really big fan of writing down in pen and ink, uh, ink and paper, along with all the digital tools, right? I got the social media, I got the messaging, I got the instant messaging, I got all these other things. But to make sense of it all, I should be able to put on an index card or on half a sheet of paper in a, in a planner what it is that's important to me today, this week, and for me, it helps me to keep track of what I deliver also for that's the other half of, half of the page. So that's not going to work for everybody, but find your own operating system and then evolve it to meet your needs as you go. I think that's phenomenal advice. Personal operating system, tailor it to your personality. If you like digital, great, but tracking both what you've done, what you need to do and how effective your being is great advice along with all the other advice you've gave in this. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing what you do and some of what you've learned. This has been fun. Thanks, Heidi. You do a, you do a nice job with, uh, with this series. I appreciate it very much. And to all your listeners, good luck <laughs> and, uh, and fair, fair wins in the, uh, in the <laughs> talent trade market. <laughs>